been talking about discipleship, right? So we're going to steer from that for a little bit because the Lord gave me something else this week. It's just put on my heart about this. Somebody said earlier this week, I heard it. They said, man, I am just at the end of my rope. You heard that phrase, right? Just at the end of a rope. That sounds really desperate, doesn't it? Because, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you, you can relate. Well, James Dobson tells the true story of a little boy named Frankie who was a bit of a handful, okay? Maybe, maybe like a kid like I or Brett was when we were little, right? One day, Frankie pulled a chair over to the front window of his house looking out into the front yard and across the street where you could see the other kids playing and he carefully placed it inside the drapes. He's sitting in there, he's looking out that window and his mother came looking for him. About the time she came up behind him, just kind of, just wanted to see what he was up to, she got in, she heard him say these words in a real somber tone, I have got to get out of here. You ever felt like that? Like he, he felt trapped, you know? Felt like he was sitting in there and just couldn't get out. You know, a lot of people are like that. And I likened that to that term at the end of your rope. Like, what do you do when you get to that point? What do we do when everything else we've thought of, we've exhausted all of those opportunities and those options? You know, the realist would say, and I looked it up, uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt also said, that uh, you just tie a knot and hang on when you're at the end of the rope, right? Now, the pessimist would probably say, you know what, you might as well just go ahead and let go because it's only going to get worse. And then the optimist, they would probably say, you know, just tie another knot and keep on climbing. That sounds like good advice. And I think in respect, just about every one of these has their own merit. But when you think about it, in reality, what can we really do when we get to that point? You know, some of us may already be in that place. Some of us have been at that place and we can testify to it. And others of us, we're not quite there yet, but it'll happen. We'll get to that in a little bit. But what happens when you're at the end of your rope and all you can see is a long drop underneath you and you don't know what to do? You know, like when you're facing problems with things at home. Maybe it's the kids have gone wayward or whatever the situation might be or a family that's divided. What do you do when there's problems at work and it seems like there's really nothing you can do about it? There's no way out. Or maybe you got too much month left at the end of the money. That's a common one. What do you do when you follow the loved one's body to the grave and put them to rest? You can't escape the loneliness, the grief, and the pain. Or maybe you're walking through a spiritual wasteland and there seems to be no way out. Well, I don't think anybody but the Lord really has the answers to those questions. So if you're thinking about any other option, let's try Him first. If He's your plan A, you don't need a plan B, right? That's not the key of the message, though. There's going to be some help in some verses that we're going to look at today. This passage talks about a person who was at the end of their rope. They didn't know what to do or where to turn. In their pain and their poverty, they did the only thing they knew they could do. They turned to the Lord. And when they did that, God came through in a big way. This this, uh, passage, it teaches us a reassuring truth that God has a plan for our problem. He's already got a plan for it. This also lets us know that when we reach the end of our rope, there is help and there is hope. So that made me think of when we're at the end of our rope, we've arrived at the beginning of seeing God really work. Amen? We give an opportunity for Him to show up and to show out, as we say. So I want to take these verses and share a few lessons that should be some comfort about finding hope at the end of your rope. That's the title for this one, all right? So finding hope... At the end of your rope. You ever felt like that? That frayed rope? It's just a couple little strands barely holding things together. So let's talk about three ways to find hope at the end of your rope. We're talking about three of them here today. The first one is God knows your problems. Right? That's good news. And uh, it's the first thing here. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. We'll start at verse 1. It's a familiar passage to many of you. Uh, this is the, uh, the passage here about the, uh, the widow that seems to have a really major problem. And we would say that she is probably at the end of her rope. So 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. And we'll just go through these to kind of set the stage for what we're talking about today. Verse 1 says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. 
But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Next verse. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Continue. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars and don't just ask for a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him. She shut the doors behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. Verse 6, when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. And finally, it says, she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. So once again, God provided more than what's needed. So let's look at things, though, from this woman's perspective. First, there was despair in her family. We know that already. The word cried, it says she cried out to Elisha. That word cried means to moan, to weep uncontrollably, to shriek out in grief. This word identifies the sound of a broken heart. And this woman comes to the man of God at the lowest moment of her life. She is desperate. The second thing we know is there was death in her family. She was married to one of the sons of the prophets. These were the men who were training and training under Elisha to be the prophets and preachers in Israel. Kind of like a seminary, I suppose you'd say. Now her husband, her lover, her friend, protector, provider had been taken away from her in death. She is broken because a loved one has been taken away. And not only was there despair and death in her family, there was also debt. It talks about the debt in her family. Since her husband is dead, she can't pay her bills. And as a result, her creditors are coming to take her sons away so they can work off the debt. Now this was allowed under the Jewish law in the book of Leviticus chapter 25. It said that poor people and debtors were allowed to pay their debts by selling themselves or their children as slaves. But these creditors, these here, they're not acting in the spirit of God's law. God ordered rich people not to take advantage of people during their time of extreme need. But they said, we're coming for your sons if you can't pay your bill. She's now deprived of her husband, and now she's about to lose her kids as well. She is in over her head in debt, and she doesn't see how she can make it. But there was also devotion in her family. In spite of all of her problems, she still held firm in that grip of faith. You see, she needs help, but she doesn't need to turn to her family or friends. We don't see that in the scripture. She doesn't try to find someone to loan her more money. That's probably what we would think. You know what? I've got this issue. I've got to pay something. So who do I know that might be generous to allow me to borrow the money and I can pay them back later? We all know situations like that. But she doesn't do that. In her desperation, she turns to the man of God for help. And as a result, turning to God. Now, Elisha was God's representative on earth, and he was her best hope at this moment. She reminds Elisha that her husband did not fear the Lord. Her life has been a life of devotion to the Lord, and in her trouble, she still trusts him, still turns to him for the things that she needs. And in spite of her pain and her problems and her lack of possibilities, because look, she's at the end of the possibilities, she still looked up to God for the help that she needed. Even though she couldn't see a way out, she knew that she couldn't see everything, but God could. Because He does see everything. And even though she didn't understand everything she was facing, maybe you can relate to this, I don't understand everything that I'm having to go through right now, I still believe that God cares. We have to believe that. And that He can do something about our situation. Because He's showing here He's doing something about hers. So, she cried out to Him in faith. I want you to note that there's some lessons in this verse that we don't want to overlook today. At some point, every person in this room and online watching right now or at any time are going to arrive at that low point in life. There will come a day when you'll reach the end of your rope. Some have already been through it, like I said, can testify. Some uh, are right there right now and looking for help. And others will arrive there someday. We all have our days of trouble and trial. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He precedes the problem with the solution, you see. 
in me, you will have peace. Because in this world, you will have troubles. But take heart, for I, Jesus, have overcome the world. Comforting, reassuring words from our Savior. Isn't it interesting that he said, I have told you these things so that in me you have, may have peace. Wait a minute, Jesus, is this a setup? What are you getting ready to tell me right now? You know, that's like giving the good news before you give the bad news, right? Okay, I got good news and I got bad news. Which do you want first? Okay. Instead, he brought the good news first. That's just like Jesus, isn't it? So when you reach that point, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they're going to try like all get out to get you to tell you to understand that God doesn't see you and that he doesn't care. You'll have people that will be the naysayers. Well, I don't know how you're going to get out of this one, but uh, good luck, buddy. The fact is, God does see. He sees everything you're facing. Not a single thing is hidden from His view, and He does care. And He cares more than you know about what you're facing right now. You see, these verses are designed to teach us our problems. While they may appear to be impossible in our eyes, they're not impossible. They're just really God's opportunities in disguise. Right? So no matter what you're called on to face in this life, learn to turn to the Lord first for the help that you need. He cares, He is able, and He will work on your need. So our first point, God knows our problems. The second way that we can have hope when we're at the end of our rope is that God can release our potential. Notice I say our potential. Let's look at 2 Kings verses 2 through 4 here. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? He's asking for a solution, and he's involving her. Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. We know that. And then he tells her what to do next. Go around and ask, right? It would have been easy for Elisha to say, Okay, sister, you have suffered enough. The Lord is going to meet your need. Just have faith and believe and just trust. And then just go home and wait for Him to work. He didn't tell her that, did he? Instead of taking that course, the Lord chose to involve this widow in her own miracle. First, God erased her faith by forcing her to admit what she didn't have. Then God expanded her faith by teaching her trust, humility, and obedience. He does the very same things in your life and mine, doesn't He? So first, let's talk about how God erases our faith. What do you mean by erases our faith? I thought we're supposed to have faith. Well, the Lord erased the widow's faith in herself through these two questions asked by Elisha. What do you need And what do you have? You see, by these two questions, the woman was made to see the size of her need. What do you need? And the smallness of her own resources. Hmm. What does that lead to? Dependency on something else. She needed everything and she had very little. She needed much, but she couldn't possibly meet her own needs. Often God will use the trials and heartaches and burdens of life To bring us to the place where we can honestly see our need and our own inability to meet it. He does that on purpose. Why? Think about it. As long as we think we can handle things, why should we look to the Lord? As long as we have all the answers, we don't have any questions, we know everything. Why do we need Him? Why do we need to ask Him? But when we stop and honestly answer those two questions, what do you need and what do you have, we realize we need more than we'll ever be able to supply by ourselves. And God does this, I'd say, to erase our faith. He isn't trying to erase our faith in Him. He's trying to erase our faith in ourselves. But you say, well, the Lord, you know, wants us to do that. But what about what the world says? Believe in yourself. Just trust in your dreams. It's okay to have those things. We're supposed to. Word says that the God will give us the desires of our heart. Now, if our desires don't line up with His desires, then maybe there's a catch in there. That's a caveat. I could have a desire to want to have a cabin up in the Alaskan wilderness, but will it really be what God wants for me to have, right? I hear they got some really big fish. Oh, she said, (laughs) Melissa said no. (laughs) Uh, Okay, in Kentucky, out there in the hills out here, okay? Alaska's a little far away, isn't it? So uh, as long as we think we can in our own power, he probably won't. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have faith or confidence in our abilities, Or ambition. There's a difference between self-serving ambition and kingdom-serving ambition. We're not going to get into that, but I'll give you that just as a reference today. 
And this is clearly seen in in this little battle that happens in the book of Joshua chapter 7. Israel had just come off a great victory at Jericho, and they were feeling confident in their own abilities. They were strutting their stuff, man. And they failed to look for the Lord for the help they needed. And a little village that should have been an easy victory turned into a humiliating defeat. But farther along, good news, in Joshua chapter 8, Israel gets their priorities in order. They put God first, and they were allowed to enjoy another victory. You know, we could use a sports analogy here of the team that says, oh, we're the worst team, we've got the worst record, we've won one game and we've got ten that we've lost, and we're going up against the team that's won ten and won. That ten and one team, if they come out and go, man, these guys are just a bunch of losers, they ain't got no chance, let's just play around and have a little fun, and then the other team, the underdogs, end up coming up from behind, right? Because the other guys got relaxed. We've seen that. It's a great story when it happens that way, and the Bible is full of situations like that where God does that. So now let's look at how God expands our faith. God expands our faith. After God erased her faith in herself and her own abilities, he began the process of expanding her faith in the power of the Lord to meet her need. Again, he does the same thing in our lives, doesn't he? How? The first way he expands our faith is personally. Elisha's second question says, what do you have in the house? It was designed to teach her that it may not have looked like she had much, but in reality, get this, she already had everything she needed to obtain everything she wanted. She couldn't see it, but God had already given her the very thing He was going to use to meet her need. Isn't that awesome? Her answer to Elisha is to tell him all she has is a jar of oil. (laughs) I just got this little old jar of oil. It was probably a little flask. And considering the situation, the oil was probably a small amount of anointing oil used by the prophets to anoint the men of God. Now the word in one version says olive oil, but olive oil was used for that for all intents and purposes. And so this little flask of oil had probably sat in the house unused since her husband had died. And that little insignificant flask of oil would be the answer to her prayers. You see, what we fail to realize is that God has already given us everything we need to get our need met. The widow said that the only thing of value she had was a jar of oil. Yet you and I have so much more than a jar of oil. Think about it. If you're saved, you're a child of God. You're a child of the King. And He has promised to hear your prayers. Look it up, Jeremiah 33. He's promised to answer your prayers, Matthew chapter 7. He's promised to meet all your needs, Philippians and Matthew. And we look at our problems and they look so large. And we look at our possessions and they seem so small. Yet we always fail to factor God into the equation. So He sometimes allows us to be in situations where our faith in Him will be expanded. Personally, I I feel like after I discovered this, I, I missed an opportunity several years ago for God to expand His faith in me. You see, to pay the light bill, I went and, ch- and, and hawked a couple of guitars so that I could get money to pay the electric company. Of course, you know, I never got the guitars back. I probably wish I had a few of those nowadays. But see, because I didn't say, well, I'm going to pray, and God, you're going to provide, and I'm going to trust you, I instead tried to do it on my own, and all I had was really loss. So we need to depend on Him and trust in Him. Now, the second way that He expands our faith is publicly. The widow is told to go to all her neighbors, borrow all the empty vessels that she can get her hands on. I forgot, I, this morning I was going to have some go back in the kitchen and just bring a bunch of jugs and pitchers and bottles and whatnot. You could imagine and, and picture them here, but I thought, well, they'll just get in the way and clutter things up. But you'd be like, what, what's with all this? Well, think about it. They were probably all different types of, well, in our day it'd be Tupperware and Rubbermaid and, you know, things like that. That's, that's what she'd probably get. But back in the day, they were probably all various shapes and sizes. Little ones, big ones, in-between ones. That's a strange command. I mean, how do you suppose she explained this to her neighbors? You know, did she say, well, that crazy crazy preacher man told me to do this, right? Right? Or did she say, don't ask me why, but I want to borrow some empty jars, pots and pans, whatever you got. (laughs) Or she could have said, I'm flat broke, but God is about to meet my need. I don't know how he's going to do it, but the man of God said, go borrow some pots, some jars. I don't understand it, but I know God is going to make a way. Could you imagine telling your neighbor that? I don't know, man. I just need this bucket because God's going to meet a, meet a need that I have. Thanks for letting me borrow it. It may have been that God used her to speak to her neighbors because now the word is out. A miracle is going to get ready to happen. 
when the children of God talk about God coming through and pulling through in a miracle, Lord, we need a miracle, we need a miracle, the rest of the world is watching. Yeah. They're waiting. The cynics are sitting there in the shadows saying, let's, let's see what really happens. Because they're waiting for God to fail. And they'll say, aha, see, he failed. I'd say, no, he didn't fail. You've, you've not acknowledged him your whole life. And all of a sudden today you believe that he's real because you just said he. Right? So, I mean, it's something as small as that. They might have thought she'd lost her mind as she went door to door. But what a witness it would have been when the Lord met her need. Amen. <laughs> God used her as a living, breathing sermon to her neighbors. <laughs> he does the same thing in your life and mine, doesn't He? We talk about how we love the Lord and it's just words until the Lord sends us into that valley of life. Then when we're there and He comes through for us in a big way, it speaks volumes to those who are watching. You never know who the Lord is using your life to speak to. So let Him have His way in you. You're a work in progress, right? And your life can be a billboard advertising the grace, blessing, and power of God to a lost world. You see them guys walking around with the, they call them a sandwich sign, sandwich board, the, one that's the board that goes over the front. We got a little one out there, but they'd wear them and they'd walk around and they'd say, eat at the diner, you know, special today, whatever. Now we got them spinning finger signs. They stand out there and shake stuff at the side of the road. But that's, that's like us. That's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be, hey, I'm a testimony to God's power. I'm a testimony to a miracle, Right? The third way he expands our faith is privately. You see, faith moved in her heart. She obeyed the Lord. She borrowed the vessels. And she and her sons, they did what he said. They shut themselves up in the house. They trusted God to do what he had promised to do. Can you imagine the scene in their house that day? There's that mother with her sons. And all those empty vessels sitting around the house. Because by this time, they don't have much left in the house, right? She's probably sold everything they had just to try to get money to to pay for everything so there's probably no furniture there's probably no you know all those things that we know in our house just a bunch of jars and pots and pans and things like that from borrowing from the neighbors and she picks up that flask of oil and one of those boys says mom what are you going to do with that oil what are you going to do with that little old thing why did you have us borrow all these from the neighbors and she says boys i don't have all the answers but i believe the lord is about to do something great in our home your daddy didn't leave us much, but he did leave us this little flask of oil. The man of God said, we're going to get all the vessels that we could get. Boys, God is going to fill every one of these vessels out of this little flask. Now you notice, he wasn't there to say, okay, now tilt it just to the left, or, or to say a prayer over it, do a blessing, go through a ritual. and say No, he said, go into the room and shut the door behind you with you and your boys and start pouring the oil. And with that, they hand her the first vessel and she fills it up. She fills up one after the other and oil just keeps pouring out of that little bottle until every vessel was filled. When that day ended, there was a mother and some boys who had learned a valuable lesson. There in the privacy of that home, they learned that God was all-powerful and able to meet every need above and beyond. You see, the neighbors, they were going to hear what God had done. If they didn't hear it from the windows, you know, they probably heard about it the next day. And they would know it on a deeper level. But this family would really know what God had done in their hearts. It was a public miracle that was done in the privacy of their own hearts. And again, when the Lord shuts us up in a total place of dependency, His people will see Him come through time after time after time. We have lots of examples. This was Elijah had seen God come through in so many miracles. Daniel and the lion's den and all the other opportunities that God took in there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They came out of that fiery furnace and didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> the widow of Zarephath, who, uh, you know, when uh, she had uh, provided food for the prophet. And then her son dies. And he's raised from the dead. How about the 5,000 plus that were fed out on the mountainside with Jesus? All from a little boy's sack lunch. Just some fish and some bread, and it fed all those people. This was the experience also of the disciples on the stormy sea of Galilee. They had seen it time and time again. And this is the experience of every child of God who's placed in a position of total trust and dependence on God. When He comes through for His people, the work He does might be widely known, but the greatest work is in the heart of those He does it in. When He moves in power, the child of God receives a lesson in faith 
that can never be taken away from them. Never. Faith is expanded and they'll never be the same again. The third thing and the third way is God gives our provision. You see, the woman and her sons, they filled every vessel. And she began that day with nothing. But they ended it with everything. That's what our God can do. So what we're really talking about is God's provision in our dependency upon Him. The lesson of His provision. Look at verse 5 in 2 Kings. It says, She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. You see, one of the lessons that we can learn from this experience is that God will do exactly what He's promised to do. Elisha promised that the Lord would fill those vessels and He did. And He's keeping all of our promises for each and every one of us too. Not a single word and a single promise will fall to the ground unfulfilled. He means it. He's going to do it. Aren't you glad? The next thing is the limit of God's provision. If you look at this, look at verse uh, 6. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. You see, the oil flowed until the vessels ran out. When the day was done, every vessel was filled to the full. There was no limit on the amount of oil. The only limit was the number of vessels. The number of containers, if you will. God's provision knew no limits in her case. And it knows no limit in yours and mine. He's able to meet every need, move every mountain, solve every problem. This may sound like a self-help kind of message. It's not. It may sound like a feel-good kind of message. It's not intended to be, but if God's Word and His truth and His promises makes you feel good, then I think you should trust that. All right? This isn't some kind of a, oh, just do the three-step plan and you'll be on your way to success. But if that three-step plan is to trust, to believe, and then act in faith, then that sounds like a pretty good plan to me as long as you're trusting in Him. You see, God stands ready to give everything that you make room for in your life, no more and no less, an opportunity for Him to show up. And if we can trust Him to take care of us, if we can get our vessels under the flow of His oil, there's nothing He can't do. What's that old saying the old timers used to say uh, about the, the spout? I want to lay under the spout where the glory comes out. I, I, that just sounds to me like you're just going to be filled and filled and filled and filled, right? Okay. <laughs> Think about this. This is I, uh, Two men went down to a lake one morning to do some trout fishing. And they stayed there all day. But one man, he had this really strange habit. Every time he'd catch a trout, he'd take out this little ruler out of his pocket and he'd measure that fish. And if the trout measured longer than that little old ruler, he'd throw it back. Strangely enough, he kept all the little ones and he threw all the big ones back. His his buddy was watching him all day long and as they were getting ready to leave and they were loading up the truck... He looked at him and says, I can't stand this any longer. I have never seen a man fish like you in my life. He said, you've kept all the small fish and you threw away the big ones. The man said, I sure did. He said, why'd you do that? And the other man said, because I only have an eight inch frying pan. (laughs) Think about that. Rather than getting a bigger skillet, he was settling for smaller fish. Does that make sense? But I believe so often God wants to give us 12 inch or greater blessings and all we're doing is having an 8 inch faith. Right? So maybe we need our faith expanded a little bit. Right? Get a bigger frying pan. (laughs) God is willing to give according to our preparedness to receive. That's what He did with the widow. If she'd had, let's say she had 100. Okay, 100 vessels were filled. Let's say she had gotten 150. Would God still have done 50 more? Yeah, he'd have done 150. If she had 300, he would have done 300. No questions asked. All out of that little vial of oil. You see, it was based on the preparedness to receive. It didn't say that it kept spilling out on the floor. Better go get a mop and clean it up. It says it stopped. So how prepared are we to receive the blessings of God? God was not content to help her just meet her financial obligations. We're not talking about financial. This is not a a, a get rich kind of thing either. But she had other needs. And he was helping her to meet her future obligations as well. He wasn't just paying off the bill. 
He was saying, you guys are going to be okay to be taken care of. The word, one version says that it was for up to two years that they were able to live off that money. There was enough to care for them for at least another couple of years. You see, but some people only bring a small thimble to be filled with God's blessings. Ask little, believe little, and receive little. God will honor your faith. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, will it be done to you? But Jesus delights in doing great things, doesn't he? Bring a five-gallon bucket, he gives you a five-gallon bucket worth of faith. Jesus delights in grace that is greater than our needs. And it was the vessels that were exhausted, not God's supply of oil. So, the prophet told the widow and her two sons to get as many jugs and jars as they could. We've understood that. He even warned them. He said, don't borrow just a few. Get as many as you can. This miracle required empty vessels. If I'm so full of me, how can I say, Holy Spirit, fill me? If I'm filled up with me, there's no room for Him. That's right. You know, we have that scripture that says, less of me, more of you. Yeah. And we have that in songs and all of that. Think about that. If I'm full of me, I can't be filled with any more with Him. These miracles required empty vessels. The blessing given to the widow and her sons was in the exact amount that they had vessels to receive. So we need to remind ourselves that we have more to do with the measurement of God's miracles than we think. We need to remind ourselves that we're directly blessed by our capacity to receive that blessing. You know, we've had conversations with some who really need a miracle. They need a healing touch in their life. But they've said, maybe I'm just not at the place to where I'm able to give God the glory that He is going to be due when He actually does that. Now, maybe they don't say that, but that might be what's being said. You see... The person who says, I'm going to give God all the glory for all of this. Those are lots of times the people that God will use the most. Now, if I go around and say, well, I really just, all I did was I just did this a few times and stretched it out in the morning and, you know, and then I, I did some deep knee bands and I feel great now. I feel better, right? That is all me. I did this. I feel this way because I, but when we say what God has done, that's what nobody else can do. So we've talked about the lesson and the limit of God's provision. So the largeness of God's provision is one of the last things here. She went and told the man, verse 7, she told the man of God, she said, go, and he said, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. When the day was done, there was enough oil in those borrowed vessels to settle her debts, to meet her desires, and supply her boys. God's supply was far more than sufficient. That's the kind of ability our Father has. To do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. All we got to do is give Him the opportunity. So let's, let's get our vessels to God and watch Him fill them all. Would you come play something, honey? Because we know that He's that kind of a God. And when we're at the end of our rope and there's... We need that hope, right? It's not just a catchy saying with words that rhyme. So if you're able, let's, let's stand up. Jesus, we know that you're ready. You're willing and you're able to work in our lives in incredible, miraculous ways. First off, we're expressing our need to you right here, right now. In fact, wherever you're at right now, take a moment right where you are. Tell him your need, whatever it is. Tell him your need. Maybe it's a, a child or a, a family member who doesn't know Jesus. And you really need your life to be the example that they see so that they'll trust in him too. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe... We're only halfway through the month, but we don't know how we're going to make it. Or maybe it's whatever it is. Just tell him your need right now. Maybe you need peace of mind. First Peter 5, 7, God, you tell us to cast all our anxiety our burdens, the things that weigh us down on you because you care for us. 
So right now, we hand you all of those things. We hand them over to you. We're tired of carrying them. We're tired of trying to go our own way. We're tired of doing things without your help. And we're repeatedly getting nowhere. We need you. We trust you, Lord. We love you. There's our three-point plan, our three steps today. Do you need Him? Do you trust Him? Do you love Him? Secondly, what do you have that God can use? Do you have a little oil? Do you have a little money? Do you have a little talent? Do you have a little time? Do you have a passion for something? Whatever you have, let God use it for His glory. Let God use it to fill the needs of others. Lord, we give it over to You for Your use, for Your plans, for Your purposes. Third, God, this morning we know that You're only limited by our capacity to receive because You have an endless supply. So let me ask you, are you ready to receive what the Lord has for you today? Are you ready to be filled to overflowing? Just remember, the capacity to which we're emptied determines how much we can be filled. So maybe we need to empty something out this morning. Lord, I need to empty pride. Lord, I need to empty those thoughts where I feel like sometimes nobody cares. Maybe I I just need to empty out anything that doesn't sound like it's from you. I need to empty out the lies that I have believed that come from the enemy that say that I'm unworthy. Lord, we know the multiplication of the oil continued to flow according to the availability of vessels. So Lord, may you find in this room and in places all over online, willing, empty vessels, wanting to be filled. Whatever size or shape or number, would you fill us all to the brim? Church, God is speaking to us this morning. The widow's miracle was measured by her faith in what she believed God was going to do. And if we'll listen to the Holy Spirit this morning, He's saying, bring your vessels and not just a few. All your empty vessels, not the ones that are filled with something else. So that you can pour into us and so that we can then pour into others. Lord, give us that unending supply of your love, your mercy, your grace, your compassion that we can share with others. You're an awesome, powerful, and almighty God. We trust you. We believe you. We love you. In Jesus' name. So I encourage you to enlarge your expectations of God ask and receive that your joy may be made full (laughs) to overflowing amen thanks for joining us online Uh, bless you you can reach out to us through the website if you need to god bless you you're dismissed